Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending this virtual meeting on the future Phoenix high capacity transit projects. My name is Brett Benninghoff, Community Outreach Coordinator with Valley Metro. Please note that participants have been muted to avoid background noise. To turn on closed captioning, select the option from the WebEx menu. If you are currently experiencing any technical issues, you may need to log off and reconnect. Or if you are on a phone, hang up and redial. If you continue to experience problems, please continue or please contact WebEx support at 866-229-3239. The format for tonight's presentation is a short presentation followed by a question and answer session. Please note this meeting is being recorded. We are providing Spanish, or I'm sorry, we are providing simultaneous Spanish language interpretation. There may be additional pauses throughout the presentation. Joining me is Lydia, who is providing the interpretation for us. Hello, Lydia. Thanks for joining us. Hello, this is Lydia, and I will be um, providing the Spanish interpretation. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Lydia, y yo voy a ser la persona que estoy interpretando en el español. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Lydia. I'm going to give her a moment to change over her audio. Okay, then, for tonight's presentation, you will be hearing an overview of five transit-related projects. Tonight, we will have speakers on the City of Phoenix Bus Rapid Transit, also known as Phoenix BRT, Valley Metro Capital Light Rail Extension, also known as CAPX, Valley Metro's I-10 West Light Rail Extension, known as 10 West. City of Phoenix will have a speaker on CAPX 10 West Transit-Oriented Development, also known as TOD. And last but not least, Valley Metro's West Phoenix High Capacity Transit Alternatives Analysis, also known as the West Phoenix High Capacity Transit AA. And following the presentation will be a, a Q&A to take your comments and questions online and by phone and we will provide instructions when we go to that portion of the meeting. Sound all right? All right, let's get started. Now I'd like to introduce Marcus Coleman, City of Phoenix Light Rail Administrator, who would like to get us started and tell you about a few other projects that we have representatives attending tonight's meeting who will be present, but are here, who will not be presenting, sorry, but are here to answer questions during our Q&A at the end. Marcus? Thank you, Brett. As Brett spoke just a moment ago, there are several projects that we will give a brief overview regarding today. We're extremely excited to share that information with you. However, there are additional projects that are bringing resources to the same geographical area. It is our pleasure to give you a brief synopsis of some of these projects which the team members will make themselves available to answer questions after the fact. First of these projects is the coming from the Department of Transportation, Arizona Department of Transportation. This is the US 60 Grand Avenue, 35th Avenue and Indian School Road intersection improvement project. Grand 35 study. <clears throat> This study will recommend, has a recommendation to raise 35th Avenue and Indian School intersection over Grand Avenue. <clears throat> the design is expected to be done in March, uh, expected to commence in March of 2024, with construction expected to begin in the summer of 2026. Next, we have from the city of Phoenix, several projects that we would like to cover as well. 
first project is the street transportation department has a 35th avenue safety study corridor this corridor improves this corridor will provide improvements including race center medians intersection rebuilds street lights pavement mill and overlay and fiber optic cabling <clears throat> these improvements are from 35th Avenue starting at McDowell north to Camelback Road. Next slide. Next, we have our Northwest Extension Phase 2 Transit Oriented Community Policy Plan. The purpose of this plan is to understand the unique profile, context, and community needs of the area to provide community engagement, to work towards a community vision and a master plan that will guide development in the area. The TOD policy plan <clears throat> with a robust active transportation component will start to do outreach in the near future. Next, we have our bike lane project, Campbell Avenue, 59th Avenue to 67th Avenue. The bike lane adds space between people driving and people walking or biking. It is important that we increase protection from vehicles throughout these corridors. And this is one of the areas that street transportation is focusing on. Next slide, please. The next item we have is revisioning Indian School Road. This project has been made possible through a $25 million Safe Streets and Roads grant that was received from the U.S. Department of Transportation to help Phoenix Street Transportation Department address safety for all roadways using all roadway users on Indian School between 99th Street, between 99th Avenue, sorry, um, the western boundary and 39th Avenue on the eastern boundary. Lastly, we have the West Phoenix Transportation Study. This study will analyze the existing street network, including the mobility, <clears throat> including the mobility, transit, and active transportation network. People walking, people riding bicycles, and other micro mobilities in West Phoenix. It will identify gaps in the network and then recommend and may have a recommendation for street transportation, active transportation needs. This is taking place in the far west valley with 91st Avenue being the eastern boundary and 107th Avenue being the western boundary. You can find more information at the website of Chatched. Next slide, please. Now I'll hand it over to Sarah Kotecki, who is our bus rapid transit administrator here with the city of Phoenix to give us some information on BRT. Thank you, Marcus. Good afternoon. Good evening. My name is Sarah Kotecki. I apologize. I'm under the weather, but I'm here to talk to you about Phoenix bus rapid transit program. Next slide. So bus rapid transit or BRT is a high capacity bus service that focuses on improved speed reliability, convenience, and the overall transit experience. And BRT offers flexibility. So we can plan and we can design a BRT system to best meet the needs of a community. And there are common recurring elements found in successful BRT systems. And these elements include, next slide please, Advanced fare collection that could be reloadable smart cards, uh, mobile fare payment. Mm -hmm. We have transit spot improvements such as uh, queue jump lanes and transit signal priority. We have enhanced stations with level platforms, um, real time information, ticket vending machines, custom buses with multiple doors. USB chargers, dedicated lanes. We want to separate buses from vehicular traffic because that will help 
increase the speed and reliability of the system. And unique branding. It's an element we want to distinguish BRT from other modes of transit. Next slide, please. I just want to talk a little bit about how BRT landed on the Phoenix map. In 2015, Phoenix voters approved Proposition 104, which created the 35-year street and transit plan known as T-2050 or Transportation 2050. T-2050 is a sales tax. It went into effect in January of 2016. And BRT was identified as a key component of T-2050 to expand our high capacity transit network. So we have a commitment to deliver BRT to the fifth largest city in the US. And as part of that 35 year goal, it is to provide 75 miles of new bus rapid transit service. And we want to provide a transportation solution considering our growth. We have 1.6 million residents in Phoenix, and that's growing every day. And the best way to move lots of people is through transit. Next slide, please. So the bus rapid transit program has a corridor, an approved corridor, 35th Avenue and Van Buren Street. It starts at Central Station Transit Center in downtown Phoenix, heads west along Van Buren Street to 35th Avenue, north along 35th Avenue to Sherrill Drive, east along Sherrill Drive into uh, the old Metro Center and, and what is now the Thelda Williams Transit Center. It's 13.6 miles in length. There are 16 proposed station locations, approximately a station at every mile location. There are 44 signalized intersections. There are seven correlating projects along this corridor, many of which you'll hear about tonight. This corridor serves, directly serves four of the eight Phoenix Council districts, and that's districts one, four, five, and seven. And as I mentioned earlier, it connects to two transit centers, the Central Station downtown and the Thelda Williams Transit Center. And with that, I'd like to introduce Joshua Matthews. He's the project manager for the Capital Light Rail Extension and the I-10 West Light Rail Extension. So with that, Joshua, please take it away. Thank you, Sarah. Good evening, everyone. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Joshua Matthews. I am project manager for Valley Metro. Wanted to talk to you briefly today about two light rail extensions. We'll start with the capital extension. Next slide, please. What you see here uh, on this slide, this green line, is the capital extension. If you have been following along on this project uh, over the past number of years, this map does look different. Originally, we had planned to have this route follow Washington Street over to Adams, south on 19th Avenue, looping around via Jefferson back into downtown Phoenix. As you see here today, it is now shorter. If you're following along with local state politics, uh, you'll know that the legislator back uh, during the summer and the governor signed into law SB 1102, which among other things provided enabling legislation for the extension of Proposition 400, which is the large regional sales tax for Maricopa County. However, as part of uh, that legislation, there was a restriction that was added to um, the state capital area. Specifically, that restriction prevented light rail from being constructed in a box 
that's centered on Adams Street, 18th Avenue, Jefferson Street, and 17th Avenue. So Valley Metro and City of Phoenix and our partners uh, went back to the drawing board. And as part of this restriction, we are shortening up the capital extension to 15th Avenue. As you see here, um, it loops back on 15th Avenue, and then we're going to be looking as part of the I-10 West extension, which I'll talk about here shortly. We're going to be looking at two different options to connect to capital extension as part of the I-10 West extension. We're showing them on this map just because it's zoomed in a little bit better to see the differences. Option one would be on 15th Avenue going north up to Van Buren, up and over 19th Avenue and the BNSF Railway. And option two would be going south on 15th Avenue, over on Madison, north on 19th Avenue, and then again, up and over BNSF Railway to Van Buren Street. Can go to the next slide, please. The capital extension now is a three quarter of a mile project. As you saw on the previous map, there's gonna be two stations. However, those two stations are split because Washington and Jefferson are one way streets. So if you've ridden light rail in downtown Phoenix, we have four total platforms, two for each direction. Right now, we are working to finalize our preliminary engineering, which we had to update in order to incorporate the 15th Avenue loop. And we are progressing that design farther as we move through the spring. During the spring, we will also be starting our environmental process which is required uh, because this project is federally funded. Go to the next slide, please. And then the next slide again. The map you see here is the I-10 West extension in its current iteration. This was approved by city council uh, back in 2001, 2000, or 2021 and 2022. As I mentioned in that previous uh, slide on capital extension, one of our first steps for the I-10 West extension is going to be looking at those two options for connecting this project into the new capital extension. As you can see here, the I-10 West extension is fairly unique. It's going to run primarily along two highway corridors, Interstate 17 and Interstate 10. On Interstate 10, it's going to be in the center of the highway until about 47th Avenue, where it will move to the north side. And as you can see on here, there's station locations as well as station target areas across the corridor. Will ultimately end at Desert Sky Transit Center near Desert Sky Mall. Go to the next slide, please. So for the I-10 West extension, we are working to bring on a preliminary engineering team to get started on the design of the project. Also, one of our first steps when we do bring on that team is going to uh, engage in some significant public engagement. Specifically focused, like I said, on those two options for connecting into the capital extension, but also discussing the station locations as well as the overall conceptual design. With that, I'm going to hand it off to Sarah Brown, who's going to talk about a companion project to these projects, as these two were focused on the transportation system. Sarah's going to talk about the coordinated land use planning efforts that are going to go into this corridor. Sarah? Thank you. Uh, I am Sarah Brown with the City of Phoenix, and I am the TOD Grant Manager. TOD stands for Transit Oriented Development, which is really essentially just compact development that is designed to prioritize people walking and biking and to provide anything else you could need close by or with easy access. So that's what this project is about. The goal of TOD is to create TOCs, which are transit-oriented communities. That makes white walking, bicycling, and using high-capacity transit, so light rail or bus rapid transit, convenient and safe, and within a short walk of stations. So high-capacity transit is designed to move a lot of people quickly, but apart from that primary purpose, it generates billions of dollars in economic development. So that's great for cities and states, but the communities that are closest in proximity really get the biggest benefits. Next slide, Brett. So Joshua showed you the corridor for this project, and really it's the same for CapEx and 10 West, but it expands along that corridor by a half mile. So. What we would like to do is work with the people who live in these communities 
to develop the vision that you would like to see become a reality in your community. And to make sure that uh, everyone who lives in these communities participates, we really hope that you will share your contact information so that when we have these outreach efforts that we can include you. We want to make sure that you have a word in how your community shapes. The purpose of oh, next slide, Brett. So the purpose of this planning project is to create two TOD policy plans to build a framework for economic development and ridership in the area. And these plans are going to prioritize investments in infrastructure, housing, economic development, transportation, and other areas. And so both the capital area and the 10 West area are going to have their own policy plans. And right now we are in the who we are phase of this project, moving into what we want, the vision for the future. And that's where you will be involved in helping to say what you want. And then finally, what the feedback that we get from that is how we get there. It's developing a plan for that. And with that, I think next slide. All right, I would like to introduce Marty Zeke. He is the project manager for the West Phoenix High Capacity Alternative Analysis Project. Thank you, Sarah. As Sarah had said, my name is Marty Zeke. I am the Valley Metro project manager for the West Phoenix High Capacity Transit Alternatives Analysis that we call West Phoenix AA. Next slide, please. The overview of this project, essentially what we're looking to do is take the section of Western Phoenix, starting at Central Avenue, where the current light rail runs north of downtown Phoenix, and look at a study area extending all the way west from Central Avenue to 99th Avenue which is right around where the Loop 101 runs in the West Valley. The northernmost boundary of our study area is Camelback Road, and the southernmost boundary of our study area is McDowell Road. Where we're at in this study is finalizing the recommendation. The West Phoenix Alternatives Analysis has been going on for a little over a year, and over the course of that year, we started out just really looking at that main map of that large area from Central Avenue in the east, 99th Avenue in the west, Camelback in the north, McDowell to the south, and through an iterative process, having gone out to the community three times, we are close to having a recommendation. Our next step is one additional round of public outreach that you'll be seeing notices for coming out in the next couple weeks. So please plan on attending, and we will look for more input as we finalize that recommendation that we will then bring to Phoenix City Council for their consideration. Next slide, please. So where we're at in the project, again, we started out with that large study area that you can see as the, the big box on the map that's bounded in the black line. From there, after looking through all the different pieces of information, we settled on a recommendation that can either start at Central Avenue and Indian School, where you see those larger spaced uh, green dashes, or at 19th Avenue in Camelback, where you see the green dashes that are closer together. From there, whichever one of those initial starting points that we start at, which are both light rail stations, the project would continue west along Indian School all the way to 75th Avenue, turn south on 75th Avenue to serve Trevor Brown High School, and then continue to meet with the I-10 West Extension Project at 79th Avenue and Thomas Road at the Desert Sky Transit Center. There is additionally an option for this project to continue an additional mile and a half west to 91st Avenue in Thomas to serve the growing medical district anchored by a Banner Hospital. The mode of the project, after looking at both bus rapid transit and light rail, was selected to be light rail. 
And with that, I will turn it back over to Brett. Thank you, Marty. We will now begin the question and answer portion of tonight's meeting. You may ask a few different ways. To verbally make a statement or ask a question, we ask that you please virtually raise your hand. Here's how to do that. For those of you using WebEx, through your internet browser, mobile phone app, or your WebEx desktop app, simply follow the instructions on the screen. If you would like to ask your question or make a statement, you can click the raised hand icon. When you are called, the moderator will unmute your mic. When you begin, please list which project your question is aimed towards so we can make sure to connect you with the right person. When you are called, the moderator will unmute your mic. When you are finished, the moderator will mute your line. And we ask that you lower your hand by clicking on the raised hand icon again. Again, for those joining us online, these WebEx instructions are showing on your screen. If you are joining by phone as a call-in participant, press star three. If you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, this gives us a hand raised signal. When it's your turn to speak, we'll call on you and ask you to unmute your line. Press star six to unmute, and then you may begin speaking. When you finish speaking, press star three again to remove your hand raised signal. If you are joining us on one of the WebEx applications, you can also submit your questions or comment in writing using the WebEx Q&A feature. These instructions are displayed on the screen. Remember, if you are joining by phone as a call-in participant, press star three if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment. This gives us a hand raised signal. When it's your turn to speak, we will call on you and ask to unmute your line. Press star six to unmute and then you may begin speaking. When you finish speaking, press star three again to remove the hand raised signal. And a reminder, if you're having technical issues, please contact WebEx help at 866-229-3239. We'll do our best to respond to questions in the order they are received. And please state which project the question is for, either in your text or when you're speaking, when you ask to hand when you were uh, called upon to speak, uh, it would help us on this end to make sure the right person is asking or answering your question. All right, so I'm going to go to the Q and A, where I'm already seeing some questions coming in, and the first one I see is from Stefan Lyon. I apologize if I just murdered that last name. This is for BRT. What other cities have we looked at to see where they've been successful with their implementation and where they could improve? All right, this is Sarah Kotecki with BRT. Thank you for the question. We back in uh, 2019, 2018, 2019 as part of the planning an evaluation for City of Phoenix, uh, BRT and corridors. We looked at other cities uh, within the United States, um, including, and we have a list of other BRT systems on our website, which we can share in the chat. Uh, but we looked at Ohio, um, Cleveland specifically. We looked at Los Angeles, um, Park City, Utah, Albuquerque. Uh, we looked at um, New York and 
also uh, up in Seattle. But the consultants that we have on board have extensive experience with BRT systems throughout the United States, some direct experience, some indirect experience. The elements that I shared on the screen earlier, I had mentioned that they are indicative of successful BRT systems. Um, and those are some of the lessons learned, um, things that we gleaned from other systems that we want to incorporate into the BRT system in Phoenix. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Now I'm gonna go over to the hand raise attendees, um, just to kind of mix it up a little bit. I see Aaron Cobb again, apologize if I uh, said that incorrectly. Um, you had a question, please go ahead. I did what, um, like, which one we're going to go with in terms of like dedicated lanes or <clears throat> is there a plan in place? Like, uh, to, like a pre preliminary plan as to dedicated lanes. Aaron, I apologize. I think the 1st part of your question cut out, uh, which project is this directed towards? Uh, bus rapid transit 35th Avenue. Thank you. All right, I'm up again, Sarah Kotecki, <laughs> City of Phoenix, BRT. Thanks for the uh, the question, Aaron. So right now, we, I have a consultant on board that we are evaluating 15% um, design. We've just begun design and evaluating the alignment, if it will be center running, if it will be side running, or if it will be parts of the corridor will be in mixed flow. So we are just in the beginning stages of the design of the BRT corridor of 35th Avenue and Van Buren. But we, the intent, as I mentioned earlier, with dedicated lanes, the system is more efficient when you do not mix bus and vehicular traffic in the same lanes. So the intent uh, is to have a dedicated lane for BRT for most of the corridor. And we intend to have uh, 10 minute headways as well. So every 10 minutes a bus uh, will be at a station. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm gonna go back over to the written in submissions and I see Daniel Portillo has a question for you, Josh. Will there be any elevated stations in the I-10 West extension? That is a great question. Um, I will preface it with at the point that we are in right now with the design of the I-10 West extension, which is at the very, very, very beginning. My answer is really going to be focused on what has been previously developed and not necessarily what we're going to start working towards here in the future. So in previous plans for the I-10 West extension, we have identified at least one elevated station um, at 51st Avenue and the I-10. There's also going to be one station because, like I said, we're in the middle of the highway at 35th Avenue. It's going to be kind of the opposite of an elevated station because I-10 is below the grade of the surrounding community. That will have a vertical circulation headed down to the station platform. Now, that being said, as part of our outreach process, as we move forward in this new design and engagement series that we're starting here shortly, that's going to be one of the discussion points. So. Uh, looking for that input and soliciting that feedback on, on not only station locations, but station design. Thank you, Josh. I'm going to bounce back over to the call in questions and the caller known as Shane, please go ahead and unmute. Uh, direct your question at which project and then go ahead, please. Shane, are you there? We'll come back to you. Uh, let's go to Graham. Are you ready to ask your question? Brett, right. it doesn't look like it doesn't look like either one. We're, we're going off mute. There you go. Graham just there we on. go. I see Graham. Questions. So, uh, 
my question is like the original capital extension alignment it had a plan to have connections to 19th Avenue, which has one of the busiest bus routes in the entire valley. So, uh, so why is that being postponed until the I-10 bus extension will be built? Joshua, you're muted. I messed up the mute. I'm sorry, Brett. Oh. Um, great question, Graham. I appreciate that. Um, so, as I mentioned in kind of these, both of these projects uh, historically were phase one and phase two of a larger project. So, we've always kind of had them connected. Uh, unfortunately, with SB 1102 and the restriction that we have placed on us, it really makes it really difficult for us to build uh, capital extension up to 19th Avenue. That's because in order for us to get over 19th Avenue, we have to build a bridge structure. So it's either um, you know get up and over 19th Avenue and, and pass it as one project, um, or build something short of that and put that as our as part of our next project. So the expectation right here, just from a funding and a um, capacity, is that we can build the capital extension, and then we can move forward with the I-10 West extension. And like I said, one of our first and um, initial outreach questions for the public is going to be on station locations. I know in the past we've heard uh, numerous times about the importance of serving 19th Avenue, not only for Route 19, um, but for the surrounding communities uh, that are there, that are located there. Um, so really, again, like I said, it, it really came down to uh, the challenge of getting up and over BNSF Railway and um, being able to put that as part of the capital extension would, would make it really challenging for us to build that project from a fiscal component. Thank you, Josh. I'm going to go back over to a written question. We have, why is the focus of the majority of projects on the West Valley? Great question. I can answer that. Because there's a lot going on in the West Valley. Valley Metro and the City of Phoenix wanted to host these meetings to help clarify and describe some of the projects. Um, we figured this would be a great platform in order to do that, get the project managers into the room, give their high-level presentation, and give you an opportunity to interact with them. Just want to get people up to speed and on the same page. We were getting a lot of questions in the community, and this was the result of that feedback. Thank you. Next up, John Demko. Hello, John. It says, since the February 3 meetings, I have ideas. Oh, this is a statement, more of a question. John, that's a great transition to the slide that you're currently seeing on your screen. Those Great ideas, put them down on paper, submit them online. Please go to valleymetro.org slash PHX future, where you can find the materials of this meeting, as well as a comment form that you could submit right online. Thank you so much for that. Okay, now we're gonna go back over to the call-in. Uh, Gerald, uh, are you able to unmute and answer your question? And please let me know which project you'd like to speak with. Not able to hear you. I think you unmuted, but we're not picking you up. All right, well, Jerry, while you get that figured out and we hear you pop in, I'm just going to jump back over to the written in submissions. This is for Marty, West Phoenix. Got one for you, bud. Why was extending the light rail down Camelback Avenue not a valid option? This is a oh. parter. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, why disrupt the flow of Indian School Avenue traffic when Camelback already has the light rail from Central Avenue westward? So thank you for that question. Uh, just as a, as a reminder, I'm Marty Zeke, the Valley Metro Project Manager for the West Phoenix High Capacity Transit Alternatives Analysis. So we looked at Camelback as a part of this process along with Indian School, Thomas Road, and McDowell to really capture that entire corridor. And as we did the analysis, the route that rose up uh, in terms of both ridership as well as potential for just making sure this project was aligning with what the future of that community would look like 
really stood out as Indian school. There is a significant amount of uh, high density housing in terms of multifamily already present on Indian school. And we just don't see as much of that along Camelback. It's a lot more industrial in different sections. And then the other part of it is really that this project, the intention of it is to serve Maryvale. And when you look at the heart of Maryvale, at least where kind of that dead center of the community is, it's right there at 51st Avenue and in Indian School. So through all of those analyses, uh, Indian School really rose up to the top. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Marty. We're gonna go back to the caller and uh, Gerald, uh, please uh, unmute and go ahead and ask your question. And that's Mr. Malarkey. Can you hear me or not hear me? No, we can hear you loud and clear. Perfect. So Thank you. Sorry about the last one. I was using a speaker. It's so this is Gerald Malarkey okay. of the General Services Administration. I just wanted to confirm are the locations and layouts, and this is with regards to the capital extension, uh, are the location layouts of the proposed stations still being developed, or are they considered already settled and not changeable? Great question, Gerald. Um, so the station locations that you see for the capital extension were approved by Phoenix City Council, Valley Metro's Board of Directors, and Maricopa Association of Governments Regional Council. So um, I will not say that nothing is immovable. However, they have received all of the necessary approvals that our region requires in order to move a light rail project forward into design and then ultimately into construction. And then I'll just note, um, you know, uh, we continue to engage uh, directly with our stakeholders and our property owners as we have been over the last couple of years, and, and we'll continue to engage with the GSA and, and the other uh, government partners that we have in this corridor. Appreciate that. And we've set up a meeting, so we'll uh, look forward to speak with you in the future. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Josh, don't go off real quick. We got one since we're with you. We got a written in uh, question saying, how will the stations along the interstate capture ridership? Will this be at the exit intersections? Will the stations have protection from the noise and heat of the interstate? A great question. Um, Brett, I'm not sure if you're able to cycle back to the 10 West map, but um, if so, great. If not, I can just speak to it. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, we have a number of stations that are uh, that have been identified. Hey, Josh. Go ahead, Marcus. Sorry to interrupt, but um, can we make sure that we're keeping a good cadence for translation? You know, we're starting to kind of get in that back and forth mode and getting a little fast. Yeah, great, great comment, Marcus. I think the last time we checked, we did not have any uh, Spanish call-ins. Um, so this part of the, just for all the attendees um, benefit, this part of the Q&A will be summarized and then translated in Spanish for Spanish readers to um, take in at the end of the uh, at the end of the public meeting series. But thank you for the reminder. I will just try to be a little bit slower in general. So for the I-10 West extension, um, as you can see, we have three stations, one on Van Buren and two on 79th Avenue that will be uh, what you kind of typically have experienced in the region, which will be in the arterial street network. However, we do have five stations that are located along the I-10. I'll talk to those first four on the west side at 51st Avenue, 59th and 67th and 79th. As I mentioned, those stations are after 47th Avenue when we move to the north side of the highway. Um, so if you can picture I-10, uh, there uh, is kind of an embankment that moves up closer to the grade of the surrounding community and we will be located right there. So the initial design, like I said in the past, 51st Avenue would be an elevated station uh, similar to what we just opened up at Metro Center uh, for the Northwest Extension Phase 2. And then the other stations would be at grade, located on either end or either side of the arterial, and would be accessed just like you would access any other station via sidewalk along the arterial street. Regarding protection from the highway environment, um, there will be sound walls and other barriers as needed. But again, on those station platforms, we are up and away from the highway itself uh, and would be closer to um, the uh, the on and off ramps, kind of a slower, more typical traffic that we experience uh, near light rail. The 35th Avenue station, and if we uh, if we do look at any other stations that are located in the middle of the highway, is a very different and unique um, application. 
The expectation for 35th Avenue, again, as we are working right now to start on the full design of this project, this is the type of input we'll be soliciting. But we would expect that, as you mentioned, that there would be uh, necessary protections, uh, whether that is walls or some other barriers to protect against uh, some of the sound, uh, noise, vibration, et cetera. The exact design of that station hasn't been completed yet. Um, and we will and, and often do look at other applications of other transit agencies across the nation. And a number of transit agencies have built stations in the middle of or next to a highway. And so we'll look to those and our consultant teams to help provide um, a great, safe, secure station design for that uh, for that area. Thank you, Josh. And next. It looks like I have a question. Where in the community was outreach completed for the West Phoenix AA light rail extension? I'd be happy to answer that. So early in 2023, we initiated our outreach by gathering up through our database emails to create a list to start sending out emails to those who have signed up for previous outreach engagement in the West Valley. That's one place we start. Next, we do canvassing where we take flyers out in the community and go to activity centers where we drop off those flyers and we interact with those agencies to let them know about future and upcoming uh, meetings. We also use social media, our website, community partners, village planning committees, as well as online advertising through the radio, through television. We submit news press releases, and they post those stories as well. We also advertise on digitally. So sometimes you could be scrolling through your phone, seeing uh, different stories on, let's say, AZ Republic or other media outlets, and an ad might pop up that you can click and go to the website, as well as connecting with other uh, community leaders um, that we interact with in conversation. We also have conducted nine public meetings in various locations in the West Valley, such as Desert West Community Center, Maryville Community Center, Adam Diaz Senior Center. Um, let's see, where else have we gone? We've done multiple meetings at multiple locations or similar locations. Um, but we're always looking for opportunities to grow in that outreach effort. And so when we do ask the community for input, not only on the specifics of our projects, we also ask questions regarding how they may have heard about these meetings and how they like to hear about these meetings. As we build up our outreach efforts, we take that into consideration to then reevaluate our position. And that has led to us doing direct mailers where we have done boundaries within a half mile, quarter mile of the routes that are being identified. We did this when we identified two options back in early 2023. We also have done door hangers when we an, an, uh, announced the two options on Indian School going to 75th Avenue and Indian School going to 51st Avenue. We did a media adjacent to both of those routes to all residents and businesses on those lines. But we're always expanding. So please use the comment form that you'll find at valleymetro.org slash PHX future, where you can fill out that information and let us know where we can go to get the word out. You can also email me. My information can be found at our, West, uh, at our uh, website for the West Phoenix project at Valley Metro. And I'm sure our lovely Jessica will throw up the link for the West Valley page. Okay, next. Jason Barr, please go ahead with your question. Uh, I see Jason may have uh, fallen off, and that's okay. We'll give him a minute to get back on. Um, we'll go back to another uh, submitted question. Uh, this is from TJ. 
I would like to know how much the 10 West project will be within the freeway ROW and where the alignment will be when there isn't available space west of 51st Avenue. Will it run as a median on McDowell? So I'm going to take guess that one's for me. Um, so I, I, let me try and grasp or summarize the question. So it's generally where is the guideway going to be located when we're running along the highway um, for the I-10 West extension? So I'll kind of walk it from east to west. Uh, when we are coming on Van Buren, we're going to get to I-17. Uh, today there is a frontage road that's southbound frontage road on the I-17. We will turn up onto that frontage road travel up that frontage road to the I-10, I-17, or the stack interchange. We'll transition through that interchange, kind of weaving through the existing bridge structures that are in there into the center of I-10. We'll run along the center of I-10 until about 47th Avenue. At 47th Avenue, there'll be a bridge structure that will go from the center of the highway to the north side of the highway into what I mentioned, that elevated station. We'll be on the north side of the highway, and if you can picture I-10 today, you have you have the interstate itself, you have the, the, the crossing bridges, and on the north side, there's a large drainage channel um, that provides kind of drainage for I-10 itself. And that kind of creates an embankment from going up from the highway and up from the canal. So we'll kind of most mostly generally be located right there on the south side of that drainage channel, and we'll follow along that until we get to 79th Avenue. And at 79th Avenue, we'll turn up into the center of 79th Avenue to Desert Sky Transit Center. Uh, did that, Brett, do you feel like that answered the question? Yes, because TJ followed up with a thank you for all your work in progressing Phoenix's transit network. It seems like things are going in the right direction and with good speed. Great, appreciate it. All right, we're going to go to a BRT question. Sarah, when will construction begin for the 35th Avenue BRT? Also, what's the projected opening date? All right, thank you for the question. So, because BRT is a brand new mode to the city of Phoenix, we are taking this serious and we are, as I mentioned, just in the beginning of the design phase. And with that, we are looking at a revenue service. So opening um, up in the year 2029, 2030. So construction is quite a few years away. Uh, we have 15% design first, which again, we just started that. That will follow up with uh, final design plans and then we'll start construction. We have, the plan is to have it up and running in 2029, 2030. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Right, this is from Michael. Hi, Marty and Brett. Thank you for your work on this project. For the West Phoenix Transit route, is there a reason that the route from 19th Avenue to Central Avenue is being looked at again? During the last round of meetings, it was shown to be recommended to go straight to Central, if I remember correctly. Marty? Thank you, Michael. Uh, that's a great question. So that is because of community feedback. There were requests to look into what the 19th Avenue and Camelback South route would look like in terms of serving that western side of the corridor. So we did an extra piece of analysis to have a really strong understanding of what both would be. And then from there, uh, we will be holding one more round of meetings to essentially have the community take a look at those two options and have a chance to provide input as to which one is preferred. Thank you, Marty. Uh, just someone, one of our guests was having some issues. Shane, I noticed that you were having problems with unmuting and responding in chat, but I do see you're responding in the Q&A box. So go ahead and post your question there and we'll get to it as soon as possible. I see both your comments in the Q&A box. So please go ahead and type in your question and we'll be able to get to it. All right, sorry about the, the problems. Uh, Marty, I have another one for you, bud. For West Phoenix, uh, why was the decision made to not extend the light rail on Camelback um, 
to at least 35th Avenue before going down to Indian School. It seems like a missed opportunity to miss out on potential Grand Canyon University student use. Thank you for that question, and, and I appreciate that. So that was studied uh, with all of the other options that we looked at. There were a few reasons. The, the first piece being that the Phoenix Bus Rapid Transit Project will have the opportunity to serve Grand Canyon University with a direct transfer to this project. And then the other piece is just as we looked at the projects holistically in terms of what would provide the most ridership and the most benefit to the west side of Phoenix and Maryvale, the option that just frankly rose up to the top was down Indian School. Thank you very much, Marty. Jason Barr asked, have you considered BRT for 7th Street and 7th Avenue? I think it would be great to build where more density is and then fan out across the valley. Sorry about that. Sarah? Thank you for the question. So at the uh, beginning stages of the planning for BRT, we looked at, we took a, a data driven approach. We looked at uh, socioeconomic demographic information, uh, ridership, future forecasting, and we wanted to focus on those areas that had the highest uh, demand and need. Uh, and that corridor that rose to the top is 35th Avenue and Van Buren. Uh, again, as part of the T2050 plan, we're looking at at least 75 miles of BRT. So 35th Avenue Van Buren is the first of many, many BRT corridors to come in the city of Phoenix. So that's um, to say that the system will grow with time and will reevaluate uh, different areas for subsequent future corridors. Thanks. This is a question for I-10 West expansion. Uh, why are target stations being aligned next to I-10 where the density in the walk shed slash bike shed will be negligible? Sorry. Is the end goal to have park and ride at every stop? Thank you for the question. Um, so I'll answer the second one first. No, uh, there is not any goal to have a parking ride at every stop. As part of what was passed by city council and Valley Metro's board of directors, we identified three parking rides along this corridor to look at. One at 59th Avenue, which is kind of where the 202 and I-10 uh, interchange was recently constructed. One at 79th Avenue and I-10, which is an existing bus park and ride today. And so we'd look at either converting that into a bus and rail park and ride or a possible extend, expansion at, as needed. And there is a small park and ride at the end at Desert Sky Transit Center, about 70 stalls. The first part of that question, you know, for the better part of about 50 years now, uh, this region, including the Arizona Department of Transportation, the Federal Highway Administration, MAG, Valley Metro, City of Phoenix, we have identified and retained space along I-10 for some form of high capacity transit. The idea being that this would provide um, some serious speed and reliability benefits uh, because we're not having so many intersecting streets and so many, um, so many of the challenges that come with that. Kind of recognizing though what you said, which is a great, a great comment that when you're in the middle of the highway, it kind of makes it harder to walk and bike and get to these light rail stations. It was decided a number of years ago that we would push a good part of that corridor, so like I said, west of 47th Avenue and most of those stations to the north side. And that provides a lot better access to, um, to the neighborhoods and to the communities. The south side of I-10 around there is uh, kind of west of the 202 is predominantly industrial and to the north of the I-10 is predominantly multifamily and single family um, and, and commercial. Uh, so we recognizing that we would be better off uh, in serving those direct riders from walking and biking, but also as part of what Sarah Brown talked about with the TOD plans that are going to go in along here, part of that is going to be looking at how to how do we improve safe and accessible connections to transit by enhancing the land use um, plans to make them more transit oriented so that our community is more transit oriented. And part of that will be looking at you know, how do we access this future light rail system. 
And then lastly, I'll note another important access for light rail is local bus transfers. And so we will be serving a number of most of the bus routes that intersect the corridor and are going to be looking at those other station areas where we don't intersect uh, local bus routes to provide good connections. And the last part is you heard about 35th Avenue BRT. This light rail project will be intersecting that BRT line as well. So we're going to be looking at those type of transfers to really provide uh, people with better opportunities and safer opportunities to access uh, transit across the region. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, Shane, I did get your second question, and that's what I'm going to ask now. I have not seen your first question, so I apologize. Um, and this is for revisioning Indian school. Um, who do we have that can speak to that? Um, the question is, pedestrian activity is very high all the way east to I-17. Why would this study leave out the area between 39th Avenue and I-17, especially with the shopping center area around 33rd Avenue? Um, my name is Paul Gerani, and uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. I am the project manager for the re-envisioning uh, Indian School Road. Um, this is a grant uh, that was uh, awarded to the city using the Save Streets for All um, program. And it was as, as a result of uh, uh, accidents and collision studies, as well as uh, vehicular patterns along Indian School Road. Uh, the corridor west from uh, 39th Avenue to 91st Avenue was identified as part of that grant. Um, however, uh, it, it, this is just the first of uh, many grants to come. Uh, we'll definitely take your comment, and uh, it, once uh, future grant opportunities are available, we can uh, definitely we consider the eastern portion of Indian School Road uh, from 39 to I-17 as requested. Thank you very much for that, Paul. I apologize that I didn't uh, introduce you before, so please forgive me. Um, I'm going to jump over to David, uh, who has his hand raised. Uh, David, are you able to unmute and ask your question? And <laughs> we lost David. All right, David, work on that, man. We're still here for you. Okay, um, I'm going to go over to uh, Mastriano. Uh, Indian School is also industrial, Air Haven Industrial District, for example. And the, oh, this is a statement. And the GCU campus is on Camelback, which I think would, uh, I, I would think it has a lot of density for folks wanting to ride the right rail. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, we will uh, definitely take that into our collection of comments. Okay, where are we at? Uh, okay, I got an I-10 West, Joshua, from Aaron. Um, okay, regarding 10 West and future grade separated stations, where that would there be a consideration to install fair gates? Great question, Aaron. So right now I can speak to kind of our current conditions on light rail and we'll note that we will uh, investigate kind of generally speaking all all possibilities for elevated stations. So right now on the Metro Center station, Metro Parkway station, which we just opened, there is no fare uh, gates. Um, it's an elevator station. We have security on site, um, but it, other than the, pay, the uh, paid fare zone restriction, um, where you have to have your, your transit pass um, present and available for security to check. We don't have any physical barrier to riding or being on our light rail system, um, elevated station or not. Right now, I think the assumption would be short of an application that goes to all of the station platforms across uh, Valley Metro, we would not be looking to provide any type of fair, uh, physical fair restrictions to just specific stations and not to the rest of them, if that makes sense. That being said, I know there's been a lot of interest in this general topic. Um, and so that that's not necessarily a definitive moving forward type of answer. It's just where we're at right now. I think uh, Marcus may want to uh, chime in to go for it, Marcus. Josh, let me add some some more context to that. Um, that was a really good answer. Um, also, one of the key factors that we also have to consider, um, especially as we use federal participation 
in these projects, um, there are certain things that we have to follow, like Title VI um, for discrimination that will not allow us to have amenities that restrict or ease access to any of our uh, system without it being a system wide change. Um, so being we can't have one leg of the system that has uh, more features that would either make it um, easier to access or harder to access than the rest of our system. Um, we have to make sure that we're um, federally compliant, that we're not um, creating a situation that would dis, um, that would uh, impact a disadvantaged um, community or put a community at a disadvantage um, versus the rest of our system. So um, that's where Josh was uh, speaking to currently if um, something like a hardening of a station um, was to take place it would be something that we would have to look at throughout our entire system um, it's not something that we could do on a single extension and it would be something that we would um, need to do um, with the approval of all of the member cities as well as the valley metro board thank you marcus and joshua i will right, we'll go next to uh, daniel portillo we use a very well named very well known name follows us quite a bit on the social media and all our projects and uh, Daniel's question will Phoenix BRT be compatible with the new copper card. When will the branding of the BRT be made. Thank you, Daniel, for the question. Uh, we will be branding BRT that will come a little bit later, probably in the next. Um, a year and a half to two years that effort will begin once we get the 15% design underway. And the intent is that it will be compatible with uh, our existing fare structure that uh, that we have here at the, uh, at the city of Phoenix for a local bus. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. We got a capital extension question. Alfonso asked, when will Valley Metro begin conversations with community members in regards to station locations? Brett, did you say this is related to the capital extension or for the I-10 West extension? Uh, it said capital extension in the in the beginning of the statement. Okay, I will. I'll answer for both. Um, so for the capital extension, as I mentioned um, to the previous, if you had heard the, the answer to the previous gentleman, the two stations that we've identified for the capital extension have been approved by city council, Valley Metro's board of directors, and those are the locations that we're moving forward with as design progresses. That's not to say that we are not soliciting any feedback on those station locations or that there aren't any concerns that uh, may need to be uh, discussed. That just means that those stations have been identified their specific location, and that's how we're moving forward uh, with the design. For the I-10 West extension, it's a little bit different. We are just now starting what's called the preliminary engineering process, which means we're really taking that line on the map and building a design, building a project. Uh, for the I-10 West extension, there will be a lot of opportunities here in the next uh, six months, year, couple years to engage on station location, station design, um, and we will be working with the community um, throughout the entire process to confirm the consensus and build a project that is uh, that receives strong support from our community. Thank you. Next is uh, Juanita Soto Ayers. Um, Marty, I believe this will be for you. Uh, is the assumption that a high percentage of individuals in the high density housing around Central and Indian School will be more interested in traveling west rather than east. Residents from the West Valley often need transportation to Phoenix College and St. Joseph's, as well as government offices in the central city. Isn't light rail on Thomas a more likely option? So thank you for that question. Uh, we certainly looked through all of the different east-west options that came out to be available, and there were certainly benefits to Thomas. What we saw through the analysis and through our community input throughout this project is that Indian School is really where the project scored highest. In terms of the high density housing right at Indian School and Central Avenue, there is a large proportion of folks that currently take the light rail down into Central Phoenix uh, for work, for play, what have you. And we do assume that as the region continues to develop, there will be folks that would like to take transit west from Central and Indian School as well. In terms of going east along Indian School, 
from Central Avenue. Uh, that just was not a part of our study area, so it was not something that was a part of this project. And we see the uh, existing local bus service on Indian School that already runs at a high frequency as a great option for folks who want to take transit east of Central Avenue. All right, thank you. Uh, we're going to reach out. Jason Barr, uh, you have your hand raised. Would you like to go ahead and unmute and answer your question? Go ahead, Jason. Just heard about the copper card for the first time just now. I wasn't aware of it. Um, and it looks like an improvement, but I am a little bit curious if there's ever been any thought given to um, having an app on your phone where you can uh, um, use to uh, ride buses or rail and uh, you, for any, um, any modality, basically. Um, I have family in Portland and when I uh, do the TriMet system there, uh, it's just so seamless. There's no card at all. Um, cell phones, smartphones are basically ubiquitous. Um, so it's not just wealthier people that have them, almost everybody has them. So uh, I, I do wonder if that's ever been considered, just using your phone for the entire system, at least as an option. Brad, I can start this one off. Um, so it's a great question, and it's something that um, has been sorely desired by the community uh, for a number of years. So right now we have uh, a fair technology modernization project that's underway. And we are uh, going through various phases, and one of those phases is exactly what you're talking about, which is mobile fare. You have your own account, you can load it, um, all those type of things. So I think we can probably drop the link into um, the chat for that project. Um, right now, you can download Valley Metro's app, um, and you can start to, to utilize that, and that's the application that that fare technology will be implemented in. Mobile fares are already live, Josh. Yep. All right, thank you for that. Go back over to the written responses. TJ, have there been thoughts about expanding pedestrian space in downtown Phoenix for ease of transfer between light rail lines where they meet in downtown? Something like expanding the pedestrianized zone on Central Avenue to encompass the entire block of cityscape. Don't you all answer at once? Well, I can speak to, I mean, I guess <laughs> I'll speak to to that as to, to the best of my ability. Um, <clears throat> as far as the downtown um, hub goes or transfer point, um, we do have what's called a downtown hub that's incorporated into our South Central downtown hub project. Um, new stations were built in Cityscape, um, which is on Central Avenue alignment in between Washington and Jefferson. Another uh, light rail platform is being constructed on the north side of Washington between uh, First Avenue and Central, and then another one that is being constructed on in the the mid uh, mid roadway of Jefferson um, <clears throat> between um, Central and First Avenue as well. Um, the reason that these stations were built is so that uh, it can act as a natural transfer point in the middle and the heart of downtown Phoenix. So as our South Central comes online, the system will go from a one line uh, rail line into a two line system, um, meaning that you'll have a north south running from a terminus of Metro Center on one end, uh, baseline road, central and baseline road at the other end, and then the east west with a terminus at uh, Gilbert Road on the west end and Third Avenue on the western end. <clears throat> we did look at, uh, we did work with our street transportation department as well as um, Red Development and our Community and Economic Development Department to expand the plaza area on Central Avenue, closing that down to vehicular traffic, uh, making that plaza area a lot larger um, for pedestrian travel. However, Washington and Jefferson, um, those are some of our major corridors that we have ingress and egress, especially for uh, events um, and also for our working um, 
a working individuals that still need to come into the downtown core. Um, so we were unable to uh, close those roadways to vehicular traffic, um, but the full footprint of cityscape outside of what is now going to be our guideway um, is pretty much pedestrian friendly now. Um, there is no vehicular ways through the middle of um, cityscape. Um, so the only thing that we will have travel through there is in that guideway will be light rail within the guideway between Washington and Jefferson and also bus will um, travel on that exact same uh, guideway. No other vehicular travel will take place in that area. So I hope that um, answers that question. Thank you, Marcus. Shane got his first question in finally. I'm glad that worked out for you, Shane. And this is for Sarah Kotecki. Uh, given the length of time that it takes in planning and engineering BRT, I would like to see effort directed towards developing additional BRT route plans simultaneously with the 35th Avenue route. The route that comes to mind for me is 19th Avenue connecting from 19th Avenue and Dunlap where light rail turns west. North on 19th Avenue to Happy Valley, where it can connect to the existing park and ride at 29th Avenue and Happy Valley to the broader high capacity transit network. Okay. Thank you for more. that question. Yeah, as we design that, that is the intent um, as we get closer to finishing up the design for this first corridor, we'll start the planning for the next corridor in the, in the uh, city of Phoenix. And a large part of that um, has to do with proof of concept and, and basically getting our first corridor um, as close to built as possible. But that is the intent that we'll start. Uh, we have a, we have a lot of miles of BRT to build, and our intent is to um, start designing or excuse me planning for the second corridor after we finish the design of the first corridor. Thank you, and thank you for that location suggestion. Thank you. And Sarah Brown, we have one for TOD TOC. Have there been previous TOD TOC programs in Phoenix or are these the first? Thank you for that. Uh, actually, we have had several TOC community plans. So it started with our reinvent Phoenix initiative, which covered uh, gateway East Lake Garfield, Midtown, Uptown, and Solano, and that policy plan was adopted in 2015 by City Council. And then the next one that followed was our 19 North Transit Oriented Communities Policy Plan, and the most recent one was our South Central TOC Policy Plan. So with each project that, uh, that we have been fortunate to be able to complete, we continue to grow and expand and, uh, and learn what more we can do to, to serve these communities. And so our active one right now, we have our um, uh, our Northwest Phase 2 extension, which is our Metro District, and so we're actively working on that. And we actually have a workshop planned for the week of February 26th, where the members of the public are invited to come participate in that. And it's an evening workshop, dinner's provided, child care is provided. And so that's an opportunity for anyone who wants to come and weigh in on that community. And then uh, we are, of course, our CapEx and our 10 West, we are hoping to have workshops for those projects sometime in late spring. So they're all moving forward and uh, these are not the first, nor hopefully will they be the last. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Graham, this is, or I'm sorry, Marty, uh, Graham has asked for West Phoenix AA. If I remember correctly, there is also a provision in SB 1102 that prevents Proposition 400 funding from being used for light rail construction. How was it decided for the route to be a light rail route? So, th Graham, thank you for that question. I'll take it at first, and then Marcus, if you want to add anything to it, please feel free. So, we looked at this project really from just what is best for this corridor in terms of what fits with the corridor. And as we were looking between bus rapid transit and light rail, the number of riders that are potentially captured on this corridor via a light rail project really helped rail to rise to the top. In terms of funding, you are correct that the new proposition, Prop 479, does not allow for the regional sales tax 
to be used in the construction of additional miles of light rail. However, that is and has always been just one of many sources of funding that we have. So yes, that pot of money is not available, but there are many others that can be looked into as potential funding sources. Marcus, is there anything you'd like to add? I think you, you covered it um, appropriately. Perfect, thank you. Guys, okay, uh, David, is there any plan? David asks, is there any plans on taking LRT or BRT, that would be light rail or bus driver transit, towards Westgate Entertainment District or towards the Mesa Gateway Airport? I can start out on that one. And then if anyone else would like to chime in. So thank you for that question. In terms of continuing the system west to Westgate, that is essentially something that would need to be a conversation had by the city of Glendale. So as of right now, the rail cities in this region that are a part of the Valley Metro Rail organization are Phoenix, Tempe, Mesa, and Chandler. In the future, that can always be something that's addressed. And then in terms of taking light rail east to the Mesa Gateway Airport, there are no current plans to extend the rail east of its current terminus at Gilbert Road and Main Street in Mesa. However, that's why we have these meetings. If that's something you're passionate about, please submit that comment and those conversations can certainly happen. This is Sarah Kotecki from a bus rapid stand. Bus rapid transit standpoint, we do not have any plans at this point to head further west, or as I said, our approved corridors, 35th Avenue and Van Buren. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Aaron has, what's the purpose of the special use platform? How will that be used with CapEx? Yeah, so I'll answer um, that one also. I think Aaron, Brett, if you don't mind, she also asked what will CapEx and 10 West be named in terms of flying names? I can answer that one too. Yes, sir. So the, sorry about the that. The special use platform, um, Aaron, is actually part of the South Central Extension downtown hub. So you can actually go out there and they are constructing that platform right now as we speak. I think they're pretty much done with it. Um, that won't be necessarily utilized for CapEx. That will be utilized uh, for current operations and future operations when South Central opens. It won't be a typical um, platform for ingress or egress to light rail. It'll just be used for special events or for operations and maintenance. When that line comes downtown, it will just loop around 3rd Avenue and come back around on Jefferson. The second question about naming. So the capital extension, the I-10 West extension, those projects are named I-10 West and capital extension. So those names stick to those projects uh, forever, generally speaking. However, in the near future, we do expect that when South Central opens, we will have a two line system. And when we have that two line system, as you say, we will need to differentiate those two lines. Um, and that's something that we expect here probably in the next six months to a year um, as we're getting ready for South Central opening, that City of Phoenix and Valley Metro would move forward with naming those lines and providing a branding for those lines so that they can be easily differentiated between each other. Thank you for that response, Josh. Okay, we have a BRT question. A 2029 finish date for BRT seems a while away. Are there plans to open smaller sections of the line? And the question, uh, the, the person uh, apologizes if I'm minimizing the work involved. Uh, sorry if I'm minimizing the work involved, but wouldn't bus lane paint with camera enforcement on buses seem like a quicker way for a first iteration? All right, thank you for that question. Uh, there is a lot of work that goes into a project of this size. And with it being the very first corridor, a new mode in the city of Phoenix, we wanna do it right. We wanna be thorough. And a large part of that with regards to design and construction, we also have a significant component for public outreach. And that will take, um, it has taken a lot of time and it will continue to take a lot of uh, outreach with the public to get everyone up to speed. And also, uh, someone asked earlier about the branding. That's another element that will take a lot of time. Um, procurement of buses takes a little over two years. So there's a, there's a lot of moving parts 
and each one of those components is, is a tremendous lift and it takes a lot of time and to expend energy and efforts um, with painted um, lanes and what have you would be a, a deterrent at this point and a detriment to progress because that will just take time away from the focus of getting a permanent solution for BRT in the city of Phoenix. So thank you for your question. All right, Marty, uh, Juanita had a follow up to her original question and she states that she was not asking regarding light rail travel east from central along Indian school. Uh, as a social worker, my focus is on travel needs from the West Valley. So residents will be able to access education, uh, Phoenix College, for example, uh, medical services, St. Joseph's as example, and government offices along central and downtown the courts. Um, Thomas Road seems to meet these needs best. Why do these needs get minimized? Thank you, Juanita, for your question. So as we were going through the process, we certainly looked at all of the different options and Thomas Road, absolutely right. There are many, many different potential activity centers and benefits that are on Thomas Road. The same can be said for Indian School, the same can be said for Camelback, the same can be said for McDowell. So we certainly looked at all of the different options and as we looked through all of the different pieces in this process, we went to the community uh, three times so far, we'll be going for a fourth round of public meetings in the near future. And this is what the results of this study led to that Indian school is really what provided that highest level of ridership and met the most need. Okay, uh, Dylan uh, for I-10 West, Joshua. It was mentioned that this ROW was identified for high capacity transit several decades ago. Have there been any historical planning uh, slash work done along this corridor previous to this project? Supposing the light rail is built there, will there be room for possible heavy rail alignment along this corridor? That's a good question. Um, the projects that we know today, we're speaking to about the capital extension, the I-10 West extension, date back to uh, the passing of Proposition 400, uh, the original uh, or the one that we're talking about extending today, uh, back in the early 2000s. And so that came about in about 2006, 2007 timeframe. It was known as the capital I-10 West extension. So the planning for these projects really got started at that time. However, in the past, there's been a number of proposals. I think the most famous would be Valtrans of um, a number of highway or a number of uh, high capacity transit corridors across the region. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, and, and maybe others can jump in if um, who are a little bit older than me um, would know, I don't believe that there's been any specific planning along this corridor prior to this planning effort when it came to light rail. I think the second part of that question was regards to commuter rail or inner city rail. Um, that is a separate project. It's kind of outside of um, Valley Metro's purview. Um, that project is like a regional project that would be either under the Arizona Department of Transportation or under the Maricopa Association of Governments. That has been studied in the past, typically not as a new core or a new rail corridor in certain areas, but utilizing existing heavy rail infrastructure to provide commuter rail service over overlap or overlapped on top of those lines. Um, if anyone else wants to jump in about past history of planning efforts um, on that question, if there's anything else that I missed, please take it away. Okay, um, the last question I have is from Aaron. When will the trains be finished being upgraded to the new system? So far, it seems there's two trains with the new system with the new color screens installed in them but no other new ones have come online yet. And if no one has the answer, that is fine. Uh, Aaron, you can email me or you can email info at valleymetro.org for that question and we'll make sure that it gets the right person to get you that answer. And we just posted it in the chat box, info at valleymetro.org. Um, 
And I'm just going to go back through to make sure I didn't miss anything. I think Juanita, I may have missed something for you and I'm trying to go back and see it. While I look for that, just a reminder, all the meeting content, uh, tonight's recording and all materials uh, will be posted on the webpage at valleymetro.org slash PHX future. Um, and I'm trying to find Juanita's question. And I am just not seeing it anymore. I do apologize for that. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, the question was, do options for transit corridors rise to the top on the basis of objections raised by wealthier residents or neighbor and neighborhoods? So, Brett, I'll, I'll start off with that one and then, um, you know, Marcus, if you want to chime in on, on that as well. Uh, when we, being the transit agencies, city government, local governance, when we look at these transit corridors, uh, we're generally looking for corridors that are going to be very supportive of, um, of transit ridership. We look at what community concerns are, what the built environment looks like, our expert expectations for future ridership and growth and development, um, both growth and population and employment. And like I said, we solicit a lot of feedback, not only from uh, just the, the public in general, but stakeholders, community activists, organizations, uh, local property owners, et cetera. Um, we don't uh, place certain opinions higher or lower based on socioeconomic status or class. Uh, we take those, uh, all the comments we solicit and we bring them together. We summarize them and work with the community to find a project that has consensus that is going to be successful and going to be supported across the region. Marcus, I don't know if you want to add anything to that as well uh, from the city's perspective. I, I think the only thing that I would add to that, um, by the way, that was a perfect answer, but I think the only thing I would add is that when we look at these <clears throat> alignments and we look at placement, um, one of the things that the city of Phoenix um, has a responsibility to do is we also look at not only serving um, a community and bringing transportation to that community, but maintaining that community as well. Um, we know that displacement and gentrification is something that is is a real, uh, a real thing, a real challenge uh, that we've seen throughout the nation, and it's something that um, the city of Phoenix takes very seriously, and we're we're very cognizant of that. And so when we look at um, alignments. As far as the technical aspect of it, some of the times, some of the, uh, well, some of the, the factors that go into that is also um, not only just the ridership and ridership propensity, um, but also right of way needs um, and impacts to private property. Um, we want to make sure that we're able to put these investments into communities where those communities can still exist and remain in place and benefit from these investments, not use these investments to be a catalyst um, to bring in um, gentrification or displacement um, due to the amount of impact um, that they have to um, a certain community or a certain area. And so um, those are some of the, the factors that we look at that. Um, we really want to make sure that the individuals that we're building um, these investments for are able to see the benefit and utilize the benefit of these um, investments into those communities. Thank you. Another question, can everyone hear me okay? I had to switch mics and get a thumbs up. Okay, perfect. If cost planning wasn't a concern, what route for a BRT light rail would you suggest? I think we all can answer this question, um, but I'll take a crack at the, the very beginning. So again, we take into account a number of criteria from cost, uh, from the physical built environment, to projected ridership. When we um, when we look at the planning and laying out of a light rail or a BRT line, so the question really is a, is just a hypothetical that really we can't answer because it is a concern. It is something we have to look at uh, because. In the long run, if we can't build the project, if we don't have the financial capacity to build it, then we really can't get into the planning and development of the project. 
So again, when we look at these projects, we look at a multitude of criteria. We solicit as much input as we can, and we hopefully choose a corridor or a project that is going to be, we have the financial capacity to build, that's going to be supported by the community, and that's going to be successful in generating transit ridership and transit-oriented communities. But anyone else can jump in as well um, on that question. Thank you, Joshua. I think you covered it. At this time, I do not have any other questions in our Q&A box or any other hands raised. Uh, we will be posting uh, links in the chat box um, as we round things out. Oh, and as I say that, we have a question. James has raised his hand. James, please unmute yourself and go ahead. And as James does that, I would just like to remind everyone that we have our comment forms posted at valleymetro.org slash PHX future. Please take a moment, go online, tell your friends, let them know we would like to hear from them. Uh, James, uh, you might be having a problem. I'm not seeing you change. Um, so if you can, please post your question in the chat box. If not, please use that comment form that I just spoke about. Um, Jessica will be uh, posting the direct links to the comment forms, I believe, as well. James, I do apologize that you were having some trouble. I went ahead and lowered your hand. If you would like to try again, please do. If it is too much, I apologize. Uh, please take a moment, uh, go to the website, valleymetro.org slash phxfuture and submit your comment there. And as we do this, we will give a moment uh, to allow Jessica to run through with the links. And I know we have a lot. And so if you miss the opportunity to capture all these links as they come by, we do have them posted again on the website, valleymetro.org slash Phoenix Future. That's PHX Future. Graham with the late question. Graham, please go ahead, unmute yourself and ask. And I do apologize to those that are having an issue. If you are having an issue unmuting yourself, I will go over the directions again. You would press star three if you would like to ask a question and make a comment. This gives a hand raise signal for those you've learned. And then to unmute yourself, you would press star six, star six. Give you just another second, Graham. I do apologize for the technical difficulties. If you are having them, um, you could always go to valleymetro.org slash PHX future where you could submit your question and comments online. With that being said, and if we have no other objections, um, I would like to thank everyone who came out this evening to participate in this meeting. We do appreciate the community's uh, time. We know it's very valuable to each and every one of you. Uh, with everything going on again thank you so much for attending tonight's meeting um, if you do have any questions or comments that need to be directed uh, to other areas within the city or i'm sorry with valley metro again please uh, send your emails to info at valleymetro.org and we will make sure to get you connected with the right people uh, I want to thank all of our project managers for attending this evening. Uh, thank you all for your time and uh, presenting on your projects and answering your questions. Thank you to the City of Phoenix and the members that have attended this evening for being here to do the same. Um, we appreciate it very much of taking this opportunity to uh, really um, inform the community uh, with what's going on because there is a lot and it's very exciting stuff for, for Phoenix. 
again, um, thank you so much for attending. Uh, my name is Brett Benninghoff, Community Outreach Coordinator at Valley Metro. Um, have a good night. <laughs>